Morning. It's good to see you here as we uh, get a chance to celebrate together. Um, my message for today is called Now and Then. And I know with Phase 5 just uh, happening on the, uh, just uh, this past Friday, uh, we're not talking about now and then later. It's something else entirely different. But it's uh, hopefully a message that you'll be able to take with you and uh, really apply to your own life as you live out your life for Christ. Uh, so as we get joined together here, uh, we thank God for the, the sunshine now and the warmth and, uh, and just being together uh, as his people. And uh, with that, I want to uh, let you know that we're going to start by calling upon our God as we make our beginning in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's have our call to worship. Together we say, but you are a tower of refuge to the poor, O Lord, a tower of refuge to the needy in distress. You are a refuge from the storm and a shelter from the heat. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. God bless your worship this day. It is good to worship with you today. I was just in the back. We're trying to figure out some technical issues. But, you know, if Internet is down, that's one thing. We're, we're going to stream uh, and share these services later if we're un unable to live stream. But for you who are here, we don't have any of those glitches today. So I'm, it's good to worship with you. Uh, let's sing to our God because of who he is, his promises, and his love for us. Hey, Mike, get those lights. like to stand with us as we sing this morning, you are more than welcome. Into the darkness you shine. How good our God is as He begins good to you. So let's give Him praise. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? Higher than 
every single day he is the same and he loves us and he cares about us and he goes before us and he goes behind us that's the God we worship today it's good to be with you here's a reading from his word may we continue to be encouraged by it he also said this is what the kingdom of God is like a man scatters a seed on the ground night and day whether he sleeps or gets up the seed sprouts and grows though he does not know how All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle in it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like or what what parable we should use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as he could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. God bless the reading of his word. Mountains are still being moved Strongholds are still being loosed God, we believe Yes, we can see that Wonders are still what you do We are here for you Coming to what you do We are here True than today. Miracles happen when you move. Healing 
is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Heaven is coming. Miracles happen when you move. It's very simple. We can go all the way down to that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But there's a way that we can express our thoughts to God and to one another about who he is in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And so we do that together now as his people. And so we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As uh, God's people, too, uh, children are going to stay here uh, for the summertime, uh, so you get to hear the message uh, along with your families, and uh, greet one another from a distance, and uh, then we'll go on and uh, celebrate our oneness in Christ through his word. We do have a staff nursery if that's needed. Dear God, our hearts are broken for this world. The hatred is palpable, the division undeniable, and the pain runs deep. We desperately need more of you. We ask for your truth to be louder than the noise which surrounds us, for your mercy to be stronger than the voices of oppression, for your strength to overpower those who seek to do harm. Where there is division, bring unity. Where there is anger, bring peace. Where there is evil, bring victory. Empower us to fulfill your mission, to answer your calling, to be the light you've created us to be. May your love, your grace, and your mercy flood this world. We love you, we seek you. We place our hope in the mighty name of Jesus. This we pray. Well, as we uh, look at uh, God's word today, 
and this theme of now and then, I want to share with you, first of all, uh, the, the passage that we're going to focus on. And Paul writes to the Christians there in Corinth. He says, we know that if this earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, and it's not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we're clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we're in this tent, this body, we groan and are burdened, because we don't wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And now the one, God himself, who has fashioned us for this very purpose in God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we're always confident, and we know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we live by faith and not by sight. We're confident also, I say, and would rather prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, for the things done while in the body, whether they're good or bad. Got a question for you. What did Prince Harry, Elon Musk, T.S. Eliot, Ashley Judd, Matthew McConaughey, Emma Watson, and Hugh Jackman all have in common? Can you tell me? Birthdays. <laughs> They're celebrity. Well, no, nah, not all celebrities. Uh, one person at 8 o'clock said they're all human. <laughs> well, the answer is they all took a gap year studying abroad. Now, how many of you people know what a gap year is? Ooh, we got some. Good. Yeah. Uh, a gap year is uh, really an interim period between the end of high school and the first year of college. And uh, the students, uh, they'll do that to deepen their professional skills, perhaps, practical ones, and even personal awareness. And we know it's mid-June now, and there are seniors who have been getting their diplomas for at least the three past weeks. And many of them are now on what is called GAP. We didn't have that in high school in my time. I know that. There's even an organization that's called the Gap Year Association, and it's to help students who want to take a gap year. And the association emphasizes that a gap year is not a year off, but it's a year on. And it's to combat the notion that students are just taking a year-long vacation from schooling. Instead, students design their year with specific goals. They use the time to gain professional skills, Maybe they volunteer for a particular cause. It could be that they travel the world. And that's just to name a few of the things that you see up on the screen right now. And it's really a critical insight for our discussion of Paul's letter to the Corinthians here. During a gap year, students are living in the meantime. And that's between the end of high school, we know, and the beginning of college. And it can be a very important time for them. It can be a valuable time. It could also end up being time wasted away. But even in ordinary pre-COVID times, Harvard University, they made it a practice of encouraging their admitted students to defer their admission and to take a gap year. And 20% of the students, the first year students, have now taken them up on that offer. So it's becoming more and more popular. It's roughly three times the number that usually defer at Harvard. Many, if not most, of the students, they will use the year to travel or experience personal growth and prepare for the future. Well, one student, Annabelle, after her high school, you know, she really described herself as a train wreck of life. Uh, her parents and friends and even her teachers were trying to just have her slide into schooling. But Annabelle, she really wanted to need some time to become the best version of herself. Well, she took a gap year, and on the internet, on a publishing website, she ended up saying that, I was able to take singing lessons, play in my alumni and town's band. I was able to produce a high school musical and even act in a play. I didn't have much time aside from work and all this, but in that extra time, I painted and I did makeup artistry. 
Some people bought my art or paid me to do their faces. And if that weren't enough, I went from being just your average cashier to overseeing the whole cosmetic section at Target. And the following year, Annabelle enrolled in a nearby university in the theater program. And she's on their staff today as a staff carpenter in that theater group. Her story is not unusual. There was a high school counselor who knew of someone who went to Thailand to work on an elephant preserve. Someone else who ended up going to Australia to work with the rugby team. There was one man who went to Denmark and stayed with the host family during that gap year. He came back to the US and ended up going to Creighton University. In a sense, gap year kids are living in the meantime. They're living between the past and the future. And they know that that time you know, is not limitless. There's a beginning and an end to it. Well, the Apostle Paul, he had an interesting take on what we call our life. And for him, his life was a gap life. That is, it was life before life. And Paul writes there in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, and we prefer to be away from our body and at home in the Lord, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. Paul is living in the meantime. Now, what does the meantime mean? Well, it's a period of time between now and then. Look at it this way. You go to the airport, uh, you get checked in with your baggage, perhaps, and uh, you've got your boarding pass, and you've, gone, you've paid all the fees, you've gone through security, and now you're putting your belt and your shoes back on, unless you went through pre-check. And so that's the now. Well, your plane isn't going to board until 90 minutes from that point. That's the then. And so in the meantime, you perhaps grab a, a bite of lunch, or maybe you're going to check your mail or email. You might have a little work to do. You might read a book. That's the in the meantime mode. Paul, too, was like that. Now, his flight was not scheduled to depart yet. I mean, his life. And it wasn't quite then. And he didn't really know when he'd be pushing back from the gate of life here. Well, in his letter to the Philippians, he tells them that he's packed and he's ready to go. He says, for to me, living is Christ. And dying is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I don't know which I prefer. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh, that's more necessary for you. And since I'm convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue to be with all of you. Why? For your progress and your joy in the faith. So that you and I together may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Notice his comment that he had said about being pressed between the two. He knew that he was living in the now, but he preferred to be living in the then. For him, it was a choice of life or death. And we know that it was not his to make, of course. God would decide that. And for us, you know, living in the meantime, it does not involve that choice for us either, one would hope. But we often feel like maybe we're in that gerbil wheel at times, that treadmill. Uh, we feel maybe in the, the pit of our stomachs that we're in a, a calmness around a sea of uncertainty. And it can feel like you know, we're just there. We're stuck. We're not going anywhere. The winds aren't blowing for us. Or at least it can feel like that. Well, the Apostle Paul didn't feel that way. He had served time in prison, right? But it wasn't bad time. It was, if it was in prison then. And when he wasn't in prison, was Paul's life just a bed of roses? <laughs> no way. He was beaten. He was abused. He was shipwrecked and even more. And living in the meantime for him meant living in some mean or hard times. But he didn't regard his gap to be an empty type of life. He didn't think of that being downtime for him. It was uptime for him with the Lord. 
Because Paul was the one, as I said you know, at the beginning too, that it's not a year off, it's a year on. And in his Christian life, every year was a year on for Paul. And that can be for us as well. It's not just for historical people like Paul. But the thing is, it won't be unless we have a mission. Now, there's no doubt that some high school students, they can you know, blow off a gap year and they can really use it as an excuse to be lazy. But really, most of the students, they have a plan. The Apostle Paul definitely did. He was quite clear about the mission of his gap life or of his time, which is between now and then. So in the meantime, you know, as he's awaiting for his death to happen at some point in his life, or maybe Jesus is going to return before he, his life ends, Paul, he had work to do. And there were people there who definitely needed Paul to fulfill that mission that God had given him. And to learn really more about a sense of his purpose, we need to move to the verses that follow what our text had earlier. And there we can see that Paul sees himself as an ambassador. And he goes on and he implores the people there in verse 20. He urges them on. Why? Well, Paul says that he himself is an ambassador. And his message is reconciliation. He says, be reconciled to God. His mission with living between now and then is to get people reconciled to God. And obviously he believes that people are unaware that God, you know, he really doesn't have any qualms about us anymore. We know that we have been reconciled to God in Christ, right? Yeah, Paul tells us there in verse 19, he says, uh, God was reconciling the whole world to himself and he wasn't counting people's sins against them. He could have, but he didn't because Christ took care of it. And as we know that, we know that Jesus' death and his resurrection, you know, God took care of everything for us because we couldn't contribute any part at all to our own salvation. This is good news for people who are ignorant of that fact. So Paul's mission is to tell them, you know what? God's got no issues with you. Be reconciled to God. God's ready to receive you as one of his very own children. And so Paul works as an ambassador for the kingdom of God. And he works to get people to really turn their faces to God and to have a fresh new start. He says in that same section, he says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation's come. He's a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. That was Paul's mission but it might not be your mission. But when you're living between the now and the then, as we are, you know, when you're going perhaps through a period of a sickness or a layoff, might be an economic downturn or even a failed relationship, just what is your mission? What is your plan that God has for you, for me? We can't possibly think that God's plan or his purpose or his will is going to be anything that's going to cause us misdirection or confusion or even despair in our lives. So, really, is there a secret to successful living? To do that when we're caught in what we may say is a no-man's land or perhaps a spiritual demilitarized zone, a DMZ? Well, the answer is yes. And Paul really mentions that in our text for today. It's buried in the middle of the verses that I had read earlier at the start. It's easy to miss, but it's there. The Bible's advice about living successfully, well, as we do that in the meantime, that was a major theme for Paul. And it was really dominating his writings. He even says here that we're always confident. And why can't he say we're always confident? Well, you go on there and he says, it's because we live by faith and not by sight. For the Apostle Paul, it's always about faith. He isn't saying that, you know, we should just fake it until we make it up to heaven and then sort of like act or like look like we're Christians. He urges us to rec 
call really our core values. Core values are the things that we won't compromise on, and faith is one of those. Jesus Christ is the ultimate core value for us, and he wants us to begin to live by them. And so he's convinced that when we do that, our purpose, our mission, it's going to reveal itself. And if I can you know, illustrate that in one way, let's move from faith to football. I know, you know the camps are just starting up now and that. Still, in, we're just starting in baseball season, it seems like. But let's take a look at football's perhaps greatest ever ambassador, and maybe you can call him even apostle, the person after whom the Super Bowl trophy is named, Coach Vince Lombardi. Well, in his best-selling biography about Lombardi, David Marinus pinpoints the moment that the Green Bay Packers began their, their march to greatness. And it began in the summer of 61. Back in 1960, they lost the championship game to the Philadelphia Eagles. The Packers blew a fourth quarter lead. And Lombardi opens up the camp, and he knew that the players, that they were you know, just kicking themselves for that loss against them. And they really wanted to sharpen their skills. They wanted to take their game from this level to the next level. And they were living in the meantime. It was from then, or, or from the, uh, the past where they were you know, humiliatedly defeated, to a, a time that hopefully they're going to start hoisting a trophy for the championships. And to a man, everyone believed this, except Coach Lombardi. When the players came into camp that summer, he regarded them like blank slates or boards. And he was going to start over with these men. And Marinus, he writes, Lombardi took nothing for granted. He began a tradition of starting from scratch, assuming that the players were blank slates who carried over no knowledge from the year before. He began with the most elemental type of statement. And he said, gentlemen, as he's holding a pigskin in his right hand, he says, this is a football. And Labardi, he took the team back to the fundamentals. He taught them how to block and how to tackle. And under Lombardi's coaching, they never lost another playoff game. They beat the Giants 37 to nothing that year, and they won five championships in seven years, three years in a row during one stretch. And Lombardi, he never coached a football team with a losing record. Fundamentals first. That's what Lombardi would say. Well, the Apostle Paul, he would say faith first. Faith first because faith is the fundamental key or secret. Paul holds up faith like Lombardi held up a football. And if Paul were coaching us today, I think he'd say, friends in Christ, this is faith. Walk by it. Hold on to it. Don't let it slip from your grasp. Don't drop it. Cling tightly to it. Defend it from all attacks. Believe in it, carry it, and it will carry you on to victory. Most high school students who take a gap year, they do it voluntarily. But life doesn't really always work for us that way, does it? Sometimes we've got no choice. A gap life may be forced upon us, and something happens, and then suddenly we're living between two points. One is what was for us, and the other is what we hope will be for us. In the meantime, in between, we've got to figure that out. Paul walked by faith, and so can you and I. Paul was an ambassador for Christ, and his mission was to get people reconciled to God. Now, we know that God has claimed you and me as his very own children, we know that the work that he's left for us is not to get us into heaven. Our work is simply to share that good news of Jesus Christ with others. Through God's Spirit, he's given us the faith to walk with him in the meantime until that then moment 
when we get to experience the joys of heaven and all of its glory. We know that God has a purpose for each of us. And God is working out that purpose for us right now. Not one year at a time, but one day at a time. Let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us and for bringing us to your house here to, to worship you. And for those who are viewing and worshiping remotely, Lord, uh, you know each of us. You've called us all by name. And as we go forward, Lord, we just pray that we can be those ambassadors of your son, Jesus. That we can share the joy, the peace, the strength that we have that the world can't give us. And so, Lord, as we walk with you by faith, we know that you will never leave us or desert us, but you'll be there. And so we just pray that uh, we have that joy that will be a reflective light to others in the name of your own son, Jesus. In his name, amen.
go to our Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, you've uh, given us so many things, and we thank you for this time now in our life, uh, even in this state, as uh, we go to a, a new phase, Lord, and we just pray that you would watch over us all and give us the, the right understandings and decisions to, to keep us safe during the, these COVID times. Lord, uh, bless our times together, and uh, may we look forward to even more in the future. Be with our country, keep it safe, and uh, be with all nations that you would provide good leaders to uh, watch over their people. We thank you for those who work in the, the health field and the, the medical areas that provide so much for us. We thank you for even the rain recently and the, the, the crops that need it so badly. Lord, we pray for your people, for those who are sick or injured. We pray for Jean Clark Sr. and Linda Brow and Gail McDevitt. Lord, we ask your comfort for the families of Robert Holtz and of Ramona Adler. Bless them, Lord. May they know the joy of the resurrection to come. We give thanks for blessings of life and for a birthday celebration for Lori Klaus, for the blessings of calling people to be your children through baptism, and for Adrian Ayumi Mueller to become your child as she did yesterday. Bless also the marriage of Ellison Hoger to Josh Bowman as they were wed yesterday down in the St. Louis area. We give thanks for 45 years of marriage to Pastor Paul and Connie Strand, for 21 years to Dale and Anna Brower, and 11 to Brayden and Melissa McClements. Lord, you give us so much, and we try to thank you, and sometimes we just can't do it enough, but we know of your endless love for us, and we just pray that we would be those lights in a, a dark world around us to let them know that you are the greatest of all. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at what's happening here in the summertime, there's lots of things you can get involved with. Uh, you can join our softball team. Any takers? Uh, how about going to a baseball game? Uh, and watching the Crestwood team, as we uh, will uh, in August. Uh, you can go golfing at a golf outing on August 29th in the afternoon, and even come here earlier as we have our Friendship Sunday on August 29th, and we'll have a picnic with uh, some, lots of great things, not just food, but a lot of other things for uh, families and especially the children to take part in. You can even sing on July 4th at our 8 or 9.30 service the Battle Hymn of the Republic, we got a special choir we're trying to put together for that. So if you've never had an opportunity between now and then, in the meantime, practice singing, okay? <laughs> uh, also, at the end of June, on this last Sunday, on June 28th, we will have our voters meeting uh, at 1230, and we're going to be going through our budget, electing two uh, board members to our governance board, and, and uh, taking care of other action items at that point. So uh, please look at all the things that are going on, and uh, if you've got any questions, uh, contact our church office, uh, and we'll take care of you, okay? All right, any other announcements? You guys you got it. All right, very good. Easy summer. Well, then uh, let's uh, pray again as we pray the words that Jesus himself gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now as we go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. promises and these blessings together. Sing them over each other. Pray them over your friends and your family. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in their children in their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand your family and your children and their children and their children make us favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children make us favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family your children, and your children, and your children, children, may his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you, he is with you, he is with you, in the morning, in the evening, in the coming, and you go away, and you weep and rejoice in
blessed, go out and bless somebody else because of him. We'll see you next Sunday.